Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Father Mitch Packle. Welcome to Scripture and Tradition, where we bring you the sacred scripture through the lens of the apostolic tradition, with a special focus on how do we also pray with scripture. Now, of course, we'd love to have you be part of the program, and you can do that by adding your own questions or comments, calling in during the live show, which is Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. And the number you can call if you are in North America is 1-800-221-9460. 1-800-221-9460. Or you can, uh, if you're not in North America, you can call, but you have to call country code 1, area code 205 271 2980-205-271-2980. You can also send us your questions and comments by email, writing to scriptureandtradition at ewtn.com, or follow us and participate with the show on YouTube. We are going to continue our discussion of the Last Supper and especially focusing on our Lord's teaching about the Eucharist and its centrality to our faith. As a way just to start that, there's something that appears in both the Gospels of John and Luke that I want to start off with. And uh, you should recall that we are going through a book I wrote called Wheat and Tares restoring the moral vision of a scandalized church. And you can get that book at EWTN's Religious Catalog. Just go to EWTNRC.com, where it is item number 81098, 81098, okay? So, um, in John 13:1 and Luke 22, verse 14, we see two very distinctive uses of the word our. Not ours as in uh, mine and yours, but rather the time our. And they complement each other, so that's why I wanted to reflect on that. At the beginning of the Last Supper, it says in each gospel that the hour arrived if that's what that means. And, of course, the obvious is that it's the time to begin the supper at sundown. That would be because, you know, the sundown is when the new day begins. The day doesn't start in the ancient world with midnight, but it comes at sunset the preceding day. And of course, that changes the day, of course, but it's always 24 hours. So that's when they begin at sunset. And it refers to that. But there's also deeper meaning in both Gospels. So let's take a look at John first. In the first 12 chapters of St. John, we see that the public ministry is described and it brings us through to Palm Sunday. That's when chapter 12 ends on Palm Sunday. And then in John 13, 1, we see a new section that is oftentimes called the Book of Glory. So the first 12 chapters are called the Book of Signs because our Lord's miracles are called signs in the Gospel of John. That's what our Lord uses to describe them. They're always pointing to something else, and usually the miracles are pointing to a sacrament. So the multiplication of loaves and fish and the changing of water to wine point toward the Eucharist. And the anointing of the blind man with mud uh, and water, that points toward the sacrament of healing and so on. So these are all part of it. 
whereas John chapter 13 to 21 is called the book of glory. That includes the Last Supper, our Lord's arrest, His passion, His death, and His resurrection, and the return to the glory of the Father. And so what we see is that the book of glory is all focusing on a small group of disciples, uh, usually the 12, a few others here or there, uh, including our Lord's mother, but it's a small group, whereas the book of signs was for the general public. That's where everybody could see the miracles. That book of glory begins in chapter 13, verse 1, with this, these words. Now, before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. So this is the beginning. And we see that there were a couple other notifications about the importance of this third Passover in the Gospel of John. Remember, the first Passover in John's Gospel was in chapter 2, right after the wedding feast of Cana. The second Passover was in chapter 6, right after the multiplication of loaves and fish. Now, the third Passover is here, and it's mentioned, for instance, when our Lord raises Lazarus, in John 11, verse 55, he says, Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and many had went up from the country to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. So he mentions the Passover there, in the, this third Passover in John 11, 55. And then in John 12, verse 1, you know, uh, right after having a meal in Bethany to celebrate the resuscitation of Lazarus uh, and Mary's anointing of his feet and a mention of Judas as a thief, stealing from the common purse. That happens be right at Passover time. Now, in John 13, it said, Jesus knew that his hour had come because of the feast of the Passover. And he recognizes this whole Passover from death and through death to life and eternal life. This is something that is going on at this hour. It's his hour to depart from this world and to return to the glory of the Father. That's what's key here. So then we take a look at the second use of our, and that's in Luke 22:14. It says, "And when the hour came, he sat at table, and the disciples uh, with him." Now, like John, Saint Luke also emphasizes that this hour of celebrating in the the meal at the uh, Last Supper is a turning point in our Lord's whole ministry. And he even says in verse 15 of Luke 22, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I shall not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. This is a turning point in Christ's whole mission to redeem the world. And we see that this great desire that he has to eat this Passover is why he had so much care as to whether or not, you know, where to uh, prepare the Last Supper. And remember how we mentioned uh, last week that our Lord did not give Peter and John the address. Yeah, go check out um, Eli living over in the Essene Quarter right across from the monument to David's death. Doesn't say that, does it? He says, just go look for a man carrying a water jar. 
and follow him. He did not want Judas to know where the Last Supper was going to be because he did not want that interrupted. It's too important. So Judas would just have to come along and then later on sneak out in order to tell the priests where Jesus was going to be found after the Last Supper. But that is why it's so important for him not to give that information. And then we see that suffering is something essential to our Lord's whole mission. This is very important because the kingdom of God will only come about because of Christ's suffering and death and resurrection. His kingdom does not come into being without his death and glorious resurrection. And that's why he said in verse 18, from now on, I shall not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. It'll come after he dies and rises from the dead. And this is a very rare expression, you know, to drink of the fruit of the vine. You, you don't see that expression in the gospel, and it's not very common in Jewish writing except in one place, namely the Jewish blessing of wine. And you see this, for instance, in the Mishnah, which is that collection of rabbinic teachings. And it's in the tractate Berachot, um, chapter 6, verse 1, that the fruit of the vine is what the way they express the blessing. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, through which you have this fruit of the vine. That even shows up in Catholic liturgy in the Roman Rite. Again, using this phrase. And then Jesus commands the disciples to drink that first cup of wine. He took a cup because, the, in fact, the Passover meal would begin with an initial cup. There are four cups of wine at the Passover. And the first one is right at the beginning prayers. And he took the cup and given thanks. And by the giving thanks, that would be the pronouncement of this blessing. So he would have just said the blessing, Baruch Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Yotzi Peri HaGafen. You know, this would be his prayer. And then he um, gives it to them. And he commands them to drink the wine. They have to drink that wine, but he does not. He refrains because he won't drink it until after his resurrection and when he brings in the kingdom of God. This, in fact, that, that statement comes into play in the writing of a number of the early fathers of the church. In fact, it's especially among some of the fathers of the church from the eastern part, the oriental part, uh, the Asian fathers who spoke Syriac, St. Isaac of Stella and St. Ephraim and, Saint, and some of the others, um, uh, St. Saint, Saint James of Serug, that they spoke about paradise as a place where they would have the best wine and these enormous grapes. Uh, and uh, this is uh, something that was very much part of their idea of paradise. And the rabbis had similar notions that in the kingdom of God, there will be this absolutely wonderful uh, wine from marvelous grapes. Uh, one rabbinic uh, text talks about how each grape will be so large in paradise that you'll be able to make enough wine from one grape to last you for a year. 
So they're, they're talking about this extravagance of, uh, of wonder and deliciousness. So that is partly what our Lord is talking about as well. So this is the meaning of the hour. And Archbishop Sheen used to talk about how Christ spoke of his hour, this hour of suffering, and understands in some ways that his death that will be at the instigation of Satan, and we'll see that coming up as we go through this, Satan is the one who instigates Judas to betray Jesus. It's not like the, the, the play or movie, Jesus Christ Superstar, where Judas is a saint. No, he's taken over by Satan. And, sa and it's ultimately Satan's hour, but Christ will have his day. The day of the Lord will be the day of the judgment of the whole world. So that's partly also underlying some of this contrast. So that's the, the use of our. Now, I especially am focusing throughout this uh, chapter on those two Gospels. I'll make mention of some of the others, but I'm going to focus especially on the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel of John. Uh, they have more information about the, the, the Last Supper. Both of them have a longer presentation of the Last Supper than the other two Gospels. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. So given that, let's start to take a look at Luke 22, verses 19 to 20. This is when our Lord institutes the Last Supper and institutes the Eucharist at the Last Supper. Now, this is a, a very important part of it um, because with this institution of the, of the Eucharist, we also see that our Lord institutes the priesthood. And the reason that we even call the ministry at the Eucharist, a priesthood, is because our Lord makes it very clear in his vocabulary that his Eucharist is also a sacrifice. That's extremely important. And it's going to be that in the Eucharist, Christ is making his primary attack at the forces of evil. They are trying to have their hour to overpower him. But he will leave this Eucharist as a defense and an attack against the forces of darkness, especially as seen in Judas, who has been taken over by Satan. And this is uh, something about this present crisis that we have in the church, a crisis about the priesthood, and about the Eucharist, so much so that our bishops have wisely called for a, a year of Eucharistic renewal that began this past Corpus Christi. And we also are dealing with a crisis in regards to the clergy, some of whom betrayed the church in Christ by committing very serious sins, as we know through the child sex abuse. Um, and some of them have lost faith in the Eucharist and abu do and introduce abuses into the liturgy. That's not so much now, but that's been part of our past. And this is what we want to address as we go through this section. So we'll pause here and we'll come back in just a couple of minutes. So please stay with us.
Hey, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, first, we don't want you to miss the 2023 EWTN Family Celebration. That'll be on Saturday, August 26th, right here in Birmingham, Alabama. And it will be at the Birmingham Jefferson Convention Complex, which is very close, right near the intersection of Interstate 65 and Interstate 2059. So you'd be welcome to come there. We just ask that you call at 1-800-447-3986, 1-800-447-3986, to register for this free event or go to our website, EWTN.com slash family celebration, family celebration. You can go to either one to register. It's free. We just need to know that you're showing up and we have enough room for you. So that's why we want you to register, okay? So uh, hopefully we'll see you there. I'll be there. A lot of us here, the friars will be there. and. Um, of course, we'll be celebrating Mass and uh, have a number of talks, some of which will be on uh, the TV. So great to have all of you join us. All right. Now, we are going back now to the part where our Lord institutes the Holy Eucharist. And we're looking at Luke 22, uh, beginning with verse 19. And something that we have to see is very important that in the Lord in the, in the Eucharist the Lord Jesus is giving us his body and blood soul and divinity this is what he bestows upon us uh, it's his very body his very blood uh, and it's a gift that is greater than all the other gifts he gives himself not something but himself and this is something that we consider the summit of all God's gifts. The rest of his gifts are creatures, but the Eucharist is a gift of God from God to us. So it's the highest gift. Now, there are others, though, especially over the last 55 years or so, who have tried to emphasize not that this is false, it's not false, but some have given an emphasis to the Eucharist as a communal meal and that the focus is on the fellowship among the believers rather than on Jesus, true presence, or the sacrificial nature of the Mass. And sometimes even the architecture of churches reflects that idea because they'll have a lot of churches where the congregation is uh, facing each other. Uh, I've seen them where the altar is up at, toward the front and then the people are si on two opposite sides facing each other or sometimes it's in a round situation. But, you know, the, the congregation focuses on themselves, and we even see this in some of the hymns, where some hymns focus on the congregation gathering and the congregation being the light of the world and other things that keeps the focus on the people rather than focus on the presence of Jesus Christ. Traditional hymns tend to give praise and glory to God. Some modern hymns that are affected by this theology of the Eucharist as a communal meal are focused on the human beings present there, not on God. And it's less about praising Him than it is focusing on our presence to each other. Another element is that the Mass is a sacrifice. I've mentioned that a couple times. And it's the nature of the Mass is sacrificial. 
The Mass is a representation of Christ's death on the cross. And it's present in an unbloody way. And the real presence of Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament uh, are, is, is the key reason we're there. But again, we've seen a number of folks, including some priests, who have diminished the Mass as a sacrifice and diminished the real presence of Christ. It was a fad for a while. I think, again, it's fading away for the most part. But it was a fad to remove the Blessed Sacrament from the church. Many churches did not have the Blessed Sacrament on the high altar, and some liturgists even would teach that having the Blessed Sacrament at the center is a distraction during Mass, to which I came to respond after hearing that a few times. If Jesus Christ, present, body and blood, soul and divinity, is a distraction from Mass, who exactly is the main attraction here? If it's not Jesus, who is it? And again, it goes back to it being one or other of us, or a group of us, or just us as a group. That's not what our Lord is doing at the Last Supper by any means. A lot of them don't think of the Mass as that self-gift of God-made flesh. Instead, they want to make it a celebration of the presence of the congregation. And then we even saw at various times politicization of the Mass. The Mass was used to make political statements. Um, you know, uh, one of my friends was at an ordination where uh, one lady was wearing an overcoat and then at the time of the actual ordination, she took off her overcoat and she was wearing uh, an alb and a stole because she walked up there to get ordained herself. Um, so this is uh, what I mean by political event. I remember back in the early 70s, some people were using mass to protest humane vitae and the traditional church teaching against birth control and a wide variety of things. This is something that we don't want the Eucharist to be. It's not about uh, using it as political theater. That's sometimes the way it came across, that it was political theater to emphasize at a very sacred moment a great uh, you know, uh, issue that a certain uh, group might have had. And those passing political issues should be discussed. But see, that's one of the reasons why it's not good to do at Mass. We can, we, we priests have to distinguish between promoting a politician or a party versus addressing the moral ramifications of the gospel and its presence, the presence of the issue in our society. So it was right for preachers to speak out against slavery when they had the courage to do so because that's a moral question. It's not about supporting the Republicans against the Democrats on slavery. And the same thing is true with abortion. We speak about the evil of abortion, not because we want to support Republicans against the Democrats or something, but we want to speak about the issue regardless of any political association. That's not the point. The point is to address the moral question of why this is an inherent evil to kill the innocent unborn. 
or the elderly who are, who are sick and, and vulnerable. These are uh, moral issues. But then to use the mass as a way to, to do a political rally would be very wrong. It would take away from focusing on Jesus Christ and him as the center. So that's a very important thing for us. And next week what we'll do is start to take a look at what is our role in the celebration of the Eucharist. Okay. All right, we're going to stop there. And we will now go to some questions. And we have a nice studio audience here. And we always encourage you to come and join us in our studio audience. And we have a question from a lady. Ma'am, where are you from? Hamilton, Ohio. Nice to have you here. That's for those who don't know Ohio, that's fairly close to Cincinnati. Yes. And so your your question or comment? Um, Please explain uh, how St. Jude was taken under control by Satan at the Last Supper? Mm-hmm. Well, be- well, first of all, it wasn't Saint Jude. Remember, there are two apostles named Judah. One is Judas Iscariot, and the other is Saint Jude, who's the patron saint of hopeless cases. Two different apostles. You know, Judah was a common name. Uh, because mo- even the word that we use in English, if somebody is a Jew, that's just a shortened form of Judah because the majority of Jewish people alive today are from the tribe of Judah. So that's all that that comes from. Uh, in German, it's uh, Juden and, and things like that. It comes often that same word. But it was also used as a first name. I know Jewish people with the name Judah as their name. So there are two Saint Jude, uh, there are two Judes. One is a saint, the other is Iscariot. And in John chapter 13, verse 2, it says, the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray Jesus. So this was something that the devil had done. He had put in his heart. Now, he's not possessed. This is not some form of demonic possession. But he had fully given in to the devil's temptation. And this is one of the reasons why it's important that St. John, and St. Luke says the same, the same point exactly. And it's important because St. Uh, John and St. Luke are pointing out that Judas had committed other sins. In John's gospel, he had been a thief for a while. And all the gospels mentioned that Judas was about to betray Jesus. And so, uh, and this is not unusual that somebody starts off with a number of smaller sins and they be give themselves permission to escalate. That's not unusual. People who start off looking at pornography, again, a lot of folks in our society don't like to hear this, but the reality is a really high percentage of people who commit sexual crimes, various sexual assaults, had been looking at pornography before they did it. That is the reality. You know, you know, we don't like to hear it because the Supreme Court has said, well, you've got a right to put any kind of pornography you want out there. But even if you have a right to it by the civil law, it is something that brings about sin. And you get permission to look at some people inappropriately, becomes easy to start looking at other people. Or forcing other people inappropriately. It's not at all unusual. Very high percentage of the people. It's not a high percentage of the people who look at porn, but the people who commit sexual assault have a high percentage of being addicted to pornography. And the longer they look at pornography, the more uh, evil it becomes. It becomes more and more twisted and exaggerated and violent the longer they look at it. 
So it's, it's not a surprise. You give yourself permission with one set of sins to do bigger sins later on. That's what happened to Judas, and that happens to anybody that gives themselves permission to cheat a little on their taxes, give a little bribe over here, take a little bribe over here, you know, cheat your customers in business. That's all sorts of areas. And then committing fraud against your bank or your corporation becomes easy. You've been doing small stuff. Not unusual. All right, we have a call from Tom in the great state of Michigan. What can we do for you? Hello, Father. Thank you for answering Christ's call to serve his church. Oh, my pleasure. Many dioceses throughout the country and clergy are promoting the Protestant-produced Alpha Evangelization Program. Mm -hmm. Cardinal Raymond Burke has stated that it is not in conformity to the Catholic Catechism of the Catholic mm -hmm. Church in regards to doctrine and methodology. Mm -hmm. He further states it does not lay a proper foundation for teaching the faith. Mm -hmm. What say you? For, I have to admit uh, at the outset, I have not seen, uh, I know that there's a lot of video productions as well as some literature with it. I have not gone through that, so I can't make uh, an honest uh, comment based on a, or, or an informed comment. So I, I, I refrain, not because I'm, you know, not willing to do so, I just don't have the data. Um, and so I would, I would uh, have to, I'll try to look up what, um, uh, Cardinal Burke has said, I have a great deal of respect for Cardinal Burke, and he's, he's a friend. Uh, so uh, I have a lot of respect for him, and I'd like to take a look. But before I could comment in any way, I'd have to look at it. Uh, I apologize, Tom, that I haven't. But we'll, get, we'll try to get back to you on some of that, okay? All right, I'm afraid I have to take a break. Uh, we'll come back in a couple minutes with more of your questions and emails, so please stay with us. Thank you. Now, before we get back to our questions, just want to remind you, uh, I'd like to have you join us uh, tomorrow night at 8 p.m. Eastern Time for EWTN Live. We will be speaking with Christine Wohar, Daniela Gurrieri, and Fabio Carini about EWTN's new movie, which is about Blessed Pier Giorgio Frassati. His, uh, the movie is called To the Top. It's really a, a wonderful, wonderful movie. I've gotten a chance to preview it, and it should be a good dis discussion of the, um, uh, with, with the, his life. Uh, he's one of the patrons of World Youth Day, and it'll be featured at World Youth Day to, you know, to talk about uh, Pierre uh, Giorgio. All right, so. Let us now go, first of all, to a caller. We have Fran in New York. Fran, what's going on in the Empire State? Oh, everything wonderful, Father, everything wonderful. Good, good. <laughs> and your question or comment? Thank you. Thanks for taking the call. Sure. Yes, Father, I was wondering, how come we don't profess our belief in the Eucharist when we say the creed? Nice and creed, apostle mm -hmm. creed. That's our belief, and mm -hmm. why aren't we saying it? In all right. Creed? First of all, let me ask you this, Fran. When were mm -hmm. those creeds composed? Oh, I don't know. 
<laughs> All right, now you've got some homework to do. No. <laughs> <laughs> the 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 Nicene Creed was first composed in 325 AD at the Council of Nicaea. There were some changes made, some additions made at the Second Council of Constantinople. So it's often called the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed. But at that time the questions that were being raised were all about the Blessed Trinity and about the divinity of Jesus Christ, and the, the, especially at the Second Council of Constantinople, the divinity of the Holy Spirit. Because there were, as a matter of fact, that in the uh, fifth century AD, 85% of the bishops in the eastern part of the church were Arian heretics. They denied the divinity of Jesus Christ and they denied the divinity of the Holy Spirit. So the creed was there to clarify this is what Catholics believe. And the bishops who did not accept that word would oftentimes be removed, especially as people said, oh, that's what our faith is? Well, then our bishop doesn't teach that, so often they were removed, uh, sometimes by force. So that's why it was there. There were no problems with the Eucharist. There were, in fact, the first time that we hear about any theologians denying either the real presence in the Eucharist or the nature of the Eucharist as the representation of Christ's sacrifice is in the 1050s AD. So a good six, uh, seven and 600 years after those other councils was the first time that we saw a problem with Eucharistic theology. And because the councils were already done and set, the question never got into the creeds. But at the time they wrote the creeds, they didn't need to question it. So it was a later issue, and that was resolved at later, at later councils. So that's, uh, you know, one of the things that's going on there. That's why it's not mentioned. Um, you know, a lot of other issues uh, about the number of sacraments, that comes from Second Lateran Council, things like that. So the, the, some questions took a long time, but the creed uh, that we use was established when the issue was the Holy Trinity. Hopefully that'll help you with that. We have another question from our studio audience. Sir, where are you from? Hamilton, Ohio. Another person from Hamilton. Hmm, their name is Legion. <laughs> <laughs> so what's your question or comment? Father, uh, you know, we go to Mass and celebrate the Eucharist and the presence of our Lord uh, that we believe is there mm -hmm. in the form of uh, bread and wine. Uh, I've read and I've heard that that is as close to heaven as you can get on mm -hmm. earth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. As a matter of fact, uh, and this is, and I think this is one of the reasons that the bishops are having this whole re Eucharistic renewal. The tension that you're bringing up that has existed since the 1960s is this. Is the Eucharist an expression of our life or, as what you're saying here, is it a foretaste of heaven? That's the question. So do we express ourselves? And that was seen in many ways at the Eucharist. As people would bring up the gifts, they would sometimes, like at a high school in particular, they might bring up a football and a basketball and a soccer ball or something as a symbol of the community. And, and it's, it's actually not something evil. It's, it's, that's pointing out that we're making a self-offering. We're giving us what we are. 
But some folks use the liturgy, and again, I can remember this not going on now anymore, but so often people were playing songs that were from the hit parade on the radio, Bridge Over Troubled Waters, a song I like. It has nothing to do with mass, nothing. It's a very nice song, very moving song, not for church. That's not it. And uh, the, another one was, today while the blossoms still cling to the vine, I'll eat your strawberries and drink your sweet wine. What are you talking about? Why is that being played at church? That was as an exit hymn. That was dumb. Song is nice, but not for church. We're supposed to be praising God and singing to him and teaching the truths of the faith, not our feelings. How the, oh, our feelings are so nice and warm. So what? I don't care if your feelings are cold. Is your heart warm to Christ? You know, this, are you committed to him? And when your life is hard, are you still committed to Christ? And whereas the liturgy ought to be a foretaste of heaven, that's why churches are meant to be beautiful places, not places that make it look like the rec room at home. Or in some places, I remember one place I went, it looked like a grocery store. You know, it was just ugly in there. Uh, so that, that's why there's a fine book, if you're ever interested on church architecture. The book is called Ugly as Sin. Uh, and it's, uh, by, I think, Thomas O'Day on why church architecture got so ugly in the 70s and 80s and restoring, and, and I see now new churches are being made more beautifully to give us that foretaste of heaven, that sense that we're there and elevating us. Don't bring, you know, our stuff up, but rather let God come to us. The language should be elevated. The hymns should raise our hearts. The church should be beautiful and lift up our hearts. That's the goal. That's the goal. And, you know, that's why a lot of people started going to the Eastern Rite churches. They never lost that. They always kept that. We have to be reminded of that other lung of the church to correct some of these problems. Sir, where are you from? Hi, Father. I'm from Queen of Peace Parish in Millville, Ohio, which is right outside of Hamilton, Ohio. Yes, yes, we've got a Another cluster one. here. <laughs> All right. So what, what can we do for you today? On the questions as we uh, were talking about the uh, celebration of the Eucharist, at the very beginning of Mass, we have traditions at weddings where people turn and face the brides mm -hmm. or at a funeral they turn and face as the casket is rolled in. But it seems like in our culture, we don't turn around and face when here is Christ being presented on the crucifix with the server processing in mm -hmm. first, mm -hmm. then we have the liturgy or the word mm -hmm. itself, the living word, being carried by a lay minister or perhaps a deacon. And then the priest, which is persona Christi in the form of Christ processing in, mm -hmm. I just wonder why don't we turn and face Christ himself mm -hmm. as he processes up for the celebration of the Eucharist in the Mass? And I, I think, you know, this is, uh, uh, again, that same tension that I've been discussing and, and why the bishops need to address this issue, that we do need to focus on Christ. I come to church to be encountered by Christ and to give myself to him. We'll be, again, we'll talk about that more next week. But we definitely want to give ourselves to Christ and receive him in our lives. This is going to be the key. And we need to put that attention on Christ our Lord. This is a very, very important part. It's not a small issue, okay? So uh, I, I think to discuss this, you know, among our fellow parishioners is a good idea. You know, this is something that we need to 
and to talk with our priest. How can we be more focused on Christ at Mass? To talk to the organist and the choir and the choir director. Is our music focused on Jesus Christ? I remember one student of mine who was the editor of religious music for one of the missiles, nationwide missile companies. And she said, oh, I never looked at the words of the hymns. I only looked at the melodies. No, no, sweetheart. Look at the words, too. You know, I'm directing my heart and my mind towards Christ. And I'm not going there for the production of a musical play. All right. Um, then we have... Uh, let me take a look at this email. Father Mitch, my wife and I both use birth control. It was prescribed by a doctor to help with my wife's cycle and discomfort and pain she uh, has during it. We have had discussions about getting off birth control, but she does not want to go through the discomfort and pain. Due to this and all that has happened in the world today, we have not been intimate in a long time. I do not want to sin, and I feel that God will punish us. I fear that my wife and I are losing our closeness, and I feel very guilty. I do not know what to do. I have anxiety and depression, and this is hard to deal with. Is anxiety and depression or being superstitious a sin? Um, you know, first of all, anxiety and depression are not sins you commit. These are feelings you undergo. And sometimes when in the case of depression, you're dealing with, uh, you're suppressing a lot of feelings. You know, that's often, uh, at least according to Alexander Lowen and others. So that's not a sin. Superstition, if you're superstitious, that's a sin. I don't know if you've been practicing the occult in addition, but you don't mention that. So I don't think there's any superstition here. You don't have any Ouija boards involved. Um, this is uh, an important uh, issue medically uh, that your wife is dealing with. And, you know, your, your doctor made a prescription. You may want to check out perhaps if, you know, the, these kind of things are changing regularly. Medicine is always developing and growing. So what you may want to do is check with a different doctor to see if there are some other treatments that can be done. And, you know, in this, you know, to find ways so that your own love for each other, which may entail taking on a certain amount of pain, but may be a way to get out of that pain and other pain as well. So check with another medical expert uh, and see if there's not another way to deal with that. I'm afraid I have to deal with the end of our hour, so may the Lord bless you and keep you and cause His face to shine upon you. God bless you, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. And we can bring you this show and all of our other shows only because the network is brought to you by you. So please keep us in between your gas bill, electric bill, and cable bill, and we'll pay our bills too. Thank you.